Welcome back to my kitchen. Let's do some cooking. Now, oh, uh, let's wait a little while. We'll come back when we're in steady state. All right, welcome back. We're in steady state. The fire's been going for a little while. This part of the pan is quite hot, but the handle, not too bad. So, how do we know? So today we're going to be talking about how thermally conductive sticky outy bits are a combination of conduction down the protrusion and convection off of the surface of the protrusion. And as we might ask ourselves, hey, what is this temperature profile along the sticky outy bit? There are some parts that are safe to touch and some parts that, ooh, that hot, 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 hot. Oh, wow, that, that, that part's really hot. Right? So we're gonna ask ourselves, hey, can we predict temperature as a function of position when there's a combination of conduction down the protrusion and convection off the surface. Let's get started. All right, so before we get into the details of modeling the temperature profile in some protrusion that has combined convection and conduction, let's take a step back and let's talk about limitations. Limitations to convection. And we're going to sort of center this around an engineering, engineering choices. So engineers choose to design systems with convection as, the prim as a primary mode of heat transfer, and engineers choose to design certain parameters in that system, but oftentimes engineers can kind of run up against certain roadblocks. Um, so, you know, if we're using convection to move heat around, you know, what might be some limitations that we might face as engineers? We'll talk about one of the main solutions to some limitations with, uh, with convection in a discussion of fins. So typically fins would be an engineering solution. Fins are basically these metal protrusions from surfaces. They can be either sheets or pins or cylinders or any number of geometries, but fins are basically protrusions from a surface. So they're protrusions to increase uh, heat transfer. From surfaces. And in particular, the strategy that hin that fins use is by increasing increasing surface area. Finally, um, we're going to uh, take a step away from these kind of qualitative discussions here, and we're going to deriving the temperature profile um, as a function of x, where x is sort of the position that we are. Um, on the fin, right? So we know when we were looking at the cast iron pan handle, the part of the pan or the part of the handle very near the rest of the pan was very hot, but temperature um, approached the ambient temperature the farther along we went down the pin. We are going to, um, you know, with some in sort of some simplified uh, cases, we're going to be able to derive what this temperature profile is. And not only is this temperature profile is, is going to be cool, right? It, you know, this temperature profile will basically say, you know, tell me what parts of that pan handle I can touch and what parts I can't. But this will also allow us to predict what I'll call Q dot fin, which is the heat flow out of the fin. So this temperature profile, you know, in the same way that we used velocity profiles to calculate things we cared about later on, this temperature profile will also be useful in deriving the heat flow out of the fin. So what might be some steps in this process that we're gonna, gonna follow here? Well, spoiler alert, this is gonna be a shells process, right? If we're looking to derive a temperature profile, anytime you're looking to derive a profile for something, um, it's gonna be a shells-based approach. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna define a shell including choosing um, choosing our delta dimension. We're then going to apply conservation of energy to that shell. In particular, once we apply conservation of energy, we're, look, we're going to look at our ins and outs and these ins and outs are going to come in two flavors. They're going to uh, 
be in terms of conduction and convection. And then once we do this ins and outs and we have our shell, we've chosen our delta dimension, we apply conservation of energy, we're then going to take, um, take limits. And when you take limits, you often do so letting your delta dimension approach zero. And in doing so, you're going to get some kind of derivative-like definition. This is basically going to give us a derivative. And if we have a derivative somewhere in there, then the equation that we get from that is going to be a differential equation. And, th and there we'll have it. So we'll have this differential equation. Um, you know, some differential equations you can solve just by integrating straight up. This one will actually need a, a few tricks. And rather than just integrating this differential equation, I'm going to do the annoying professor thing where I'm going to be like, well, solutions exist of the form blah, blah, blah. And then you can see that the solution satisfies the differential equation. It's always annoyed me as a student because it's like, well, how was I supposed to get the answer? You already knew the answer and you're just telling me that it's the answer. And I'm going to do that annoying thing too. Sorry about that. So we'll look at the tricks and we'll look at the general solution. And, uh, and hopefully this will be, you know, not too annoying. It'll be at least a little bit satisfying to look at this result. But of course, this general solution has kind of undetermined coefficients in the same way that you would get if you had constants of integration. So when you have uh, un unknown constants, so we get our general solution. And, and in particular, we're going to resolve unknown constants. Well, how do you go about unresolving constants? Uh, or resolving unknown constants, you do so with your boundary conditions. And then once we've applied um, our boundary conditions, this will give us all of the information we need to have our, our temperature profile as a function of position. And then as described here, once we have our temperature profile as a function of position, what we're going to do in particular is we're going to evaluate it um, we're going to use this to evaluate minus k times cross-sectional area times dt dx evaluated at the base of the fin. And this, this is basically conduction through the base of the fin. conduction into the base of the fin and of course any fin any heat that sort of gets conducted into the base of the fin eventually leaves via convection out of the rest of the fin so what does this mean this basically gives us the heat flow out of the fin uh, which is going to be a useful shortcut rather than sort of looking at every little bit every little bit of heat that leaves out of every part of the whole fin, we can just say, hey, some heat gets dumped into the base, and as long as I have a way to describe this heat that flows into the base in terms of other things that I care about, that's going to give me all the information I need to, um, to help solve a, a fair number of problems. So this will basically give us the heat rejected through the fin. And, you know, hopefully this idea of rejecting heat through the fin, you know, we can tie it back to this idea that fins are these protrusions which can help increase heat transfer. So um, the heat rejected by a fin, you know, in many cases can actually increase heat transfer from a surface by sort of effectively increasing surface area. So, um, so this is, this is going to be our problem solving strategy for modeling heat flow that flows into, into the base of a fin and some of it gets kind of con, uh, convected out sort of at every point along the fin. So with that in mind, let's now talk about, hey, why do we even care about fins or why do we even want fins in general? And this is, uh, this is with this idea in mind that there are certain limits to convection. So first of all, why do we even care about fins? Or why do we even care about um, effective convection? Well, convection is useful for heating and cooling. 
Um, and in an engineering context, it's oftentimes the cooling that is the most useful part for convection. So uh, you might uh, you might have heard that uh, to do DNA amplification, via via polymerase chain reaction, you basically have you know some vial or some other container with your with your nucleotides and your DNA in it and you basically need to cycle between three temperatures so if you need to cycle between three temperatures um, you basically need one temperature to take double-stranded DNA and break it into two pieces then you need to cool it down a little bit in order to get primers to stick to those two pieces and then you uh, and then you need to change the temperature again to basically get the polymerase to latch on and then start uh, churning away to create double-stranded copies and now then you have double-stranded copies that you then need to bring back to the original temperature to break it apart again so it basically involves cycling between these three temperatures and going from the very hot state where your double-stranded DNA is split apart to the cooler state where the primers can latch on um, takes time. And in fact, to go through the number of cycles that you need to get appreciably, uh, to get appreciable amounts of DNA amplified takes sometimes like hour, an hour at least, or several hours to basically go through that, you know, the heating up. The heating up can actually be done pretty quickly because you can turn on powerful heaters, but you can't necessarily turn on powerful unheaters. And the way to get that heat rejected is to is to use convection, um, but convection can often oftentimes be pretty slow. Um, and you know, right now this lecture, I'm recording this lecture in the summer of 2020, and we're in the middle of a pandemic, and uh, a viral pandemic. And basically, this viral pandemic, one of the ways that we test whether so whether someone ha is, has an active infection case is to get a sample from uh, a sample of um, a sample from that patient and then amplify that patient sample using PCR and the faster you can amplify the more throughput our existing um, test testing facilities can have for these patients so you know any engineering that can be done to increase the uh, or to decrease the time it takes to do this PCR process could lead to faster and more effective testing for patients but I digress right so you know what, what, so what's the moral of the story? Faster cooling can lead to uh, can lead to better medicine, um, and PCR is just one of those parts. So, uh, so here we are caring about convection, particularly for cooling, because that's often one of the rate limiting steps in uh, in processes like this. So when we think about convection, we like to think about Newton's law of cooling. or Newton's Coles Law. So when we think about Newton's Coles Law, I have some surface, right, and the surface is hot. Let's say, let's, you know, let's just imagine that the surface is hot and the, and the fluid kind of flowing by it is cold. You know, the surface is hot. Um, I like to think about the heat that flows from the solid surface to the fluid as my, as my convection. And Newton's law of cooling basically says that convection is uh, is proportional to a couple of things. Well, the first thing that it's proportional to, proportional to is the difference between the surface temperature and T infinity, the cold, the temperature of the cold fluid. Right. The more the greater the difference in these two temperatures, the more heat that's going to flow between them. It's also proportional to the area of the surface, right? If I have a tiny little thing, then only so much heat's flowing out of it, whereas if I double the area of that surface, then I might double the heat flow out of it because there's just more contact between the solid surface and the fluid, so more heat can flow out. And then the final thing um, is this proportionality constant H, which basically relates to the properties of the fluid um, and also the sort of conditions of the flow. You know, if the, to if the flow is turbulent, you'll typically end up with a higher H than if the flow is laminar. So we have these three factors that flow into this.
And a lot of times, you know, if we want to use convection for cooling our PCR samples or anything like that, you might want to basically have this be as hot as possible. Or sorry, ha um, have this have this convective heat flow. Uh, um, you know, the watts. The, the more watts, um, the more joules per second flow out of the surface. So the less time it takes me to take that certain number of joules out of my PCR sample. So let's think about how you know how various term you know what in an engineering sense um, how much control we have over certain uh, over certain terms here. So so the first term let's look at here. So for engineering use, for engineering choices, you know if I wanted to increase the rate of heat transfer, I could up my surface temperature, or I could lower my coolant temperature. Um, a lot of times, various systems, for example, my laptop, which you might hear humming away in the background, is sort of limited by the ambient temperature. My laptop is air-cooled, so there's nothing really my laptop, my laptop can do about T infinity. And you know, if my laptop, my CPU is producing some heat, you know, I want, I don't, I don't want my CPU to overheat, so I don't want this TS to get to get that high, right? So a lot of times, you know, these these things were constrained in some way. So, you know, sometimes we could use, we perhaps could use colder coolant, but, you know, even then there's sometimes limitations on this. Um, sort of looking over here at this H, you know, we have a couple of choices for H, right? I could use a fluid with better thermal properties. Right, so this might so for example here, you know, this might be um, why some people use liquid cooled um, components to cool their you know high performance PCs as opposed to you know um, fans to blow air. You know, water is typically a better heat transfer medium than air. So you know, yeah, you could choose to use a fluid with better thermal properties. Um, alternatively, you can um, flow the fluid faster. So, you know, if I, for example, were instead of recording this lecture, decided to play some computer games, you might hear the fan on my PC go and like, you know, crank up the, the, the flow rate to basically say, hey, you know, if we're going to uh, maintain, you know, the same temperature difference that's not going to overheat my computer, I better increase my H because I'm expecting that my chips are going to be producing a lot more heat that needs to get taken away. So, you know, I could flow the fluid faster to account for that. So, you know, we certainly have all these, um, you know, we certainly have, sometimes we have engineering choices about this, oftentimes we have engineering choices about this, but in terms of both of these, we have limitations, right? You know, sometimes, you know, it's impractical to have a water coolant system and you just rely, you rely on air cooling. You know, sometimes there are limitations in terms of how fast you can flow the um flow the fluid you know there's a you know the little the little fans in my laptop can only blow that air so fast and a lot of times your the environment that you're in or the limitations in terms of your hardware place limit um, you know place constraints on what sort of temperatures you can deal with so a lot of times that leaves really only surface area as something that we can play with right so so what does this mean larger So larger surface area might lead to uh, like might lead to higher heat transfer rates. So how do we go about you know so what might be a way that engineers could increase surface area? Well, let's just imagine I had two surfaces. One surface that's just sort of a blank surface like this, and then another surface where I've welded a bunch of protrusions that stick out from the surface, right? So maybe it looks like Right, and you know, they could be rods or they could be uh, metal plates, something like that, right? So when I talk about fins I'm not talking about fins of fish. I'm basically talking about these these protrusions here, where, I, where I'd call one of these. I would call a fin. So 
Um, so you know what's what's going on here? Well, um, since this this q dot convection is proportional to the surface area, you know if I think about these two surfaces, um, if convection is sort of like a limiting a limiting factor in my heat transfer system, you know increase the fins basically increase increase surface area. And if I increase surface area, then this surface over here is going to be able to reject far more heat to the environment than this one. So take a moment now, pause and ponder the following. Let's say I have surface one and surface two. Let's say the, the fins that I added to surface two So the added fins on number two, let's say double, double the surface area. Would the heat flow from the surface? Let's say would Q dot two, um, how would Q dot two compare compared to Q dot for, for surface one, right? So I have some heat that's flowing out of this surface, some heat that's essentially flowing, you know, out of all of these fins as well, sort of overall from, from the second one. You know, how do these two heats, how do these two heat flows compare to each other? Well, hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder it. You know, I think we could all, you know, if these fin, these fins are here, as long as they're not made of some you know, silly insulating material like this, the presence of these fins would probably increase, right? So Q2 is probably bigger than Q1. Now, pa pause and ponder a follow-up question. How does, does it, does it double, right? So let's say, you know, let's say we're doubling the surface area does this, is this heat flow gonna be double that heat flow? Well, hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder. The answer is like, yes, it, in, it increases, but probably not double. And the rationale, so, so what's the rationale here? Well, you know, yes, I've increased surface area, and yes, doubling AS would increase Q dot convection, but that's only if the rest of these things in the in this equation stay the same. So what's what's probably, you know, what stays the same, what probably doesn't stay the same? Well, you know, here I could say everything is, let's say, at TS. But here, I might not necessarily have TS here versus the the same TS here. So here, let's call this TS at the base. And here, let's call this TS at the tip. If there is some heat being conducted down the length of the fin, then these two can't be the same, right? If I have Fourier's law of conduction saying there needs to be a temperature gradient within this fin, so there needs to be a temperature difference between the base and the tip. If there's a temperature difference between the base and the tip, that basically means that locally, there's less convection from the tip than the base. And why it's that, that's basically, you know, yes, it putting these fins increases your surface area, but here your TS isn't some constant, like in this case, here we have some variable TS where we have a hot base and a cool tip, you know, this if the fluid is cooler than the surface, um, we have a hot base and a cool tip, so the heat flowing out of the bottom might be a lot more than the heat flowing down the tip, and we need to account for that, right? And this is, you know, this sort of fits with our intuitions, like looking at that cast iron pan, that the part of that cast iron pan's handle that was very close to the, to the heated part of the pan was probably rejecting a lot more heat to the environment than the tip that was safe enough for me to touch. So, well, so what's going on here? Adding fins increases surface area, that's good, 
but it introduces this complexity of now instead of having a constant surface temperature over our whole plate, we have this, this deal where we have variable temperature, uh, temperature along the thin, and if we have variable temperature along the thin, the heat being rejected by each part of the thin is different. And uh, so what are we gonna do for the rest of this lecture? Well, we're gonna go ahead and derive what this temperature profile is, and we're basically going to figure out how much heat is flowing into the base of the fin, because basically all, if, if we know how much heat flows into the base of the fin, all of that heat is heat that must eventually get rejected out of the fin. And once we've done this, we can sort of side, sidestep all of the complexity of heat being rejected at each point in the fin and sort of look at overall heat flows. And then we can say, hey, you know, if we're making, if we're trying to make engineering choices about whether we need fins or not, knowing overall heat flows will allow us to design fins with a, that, that can accommodate appropriate levels of heat transfer. So let's get started in deriving this temperature profile. Actually, never not. I don't want to get, get started in deriving this temperature profile yet. I want to include just a couple more, or just one more awesome example of fins. So let's do that. So right now I live in a sort of dinosaur-oriented household, and one of the dinosaurs that is, well, was one of my favorites when I was a kid is the Stegosaurus. And the Stegosaurus, you might have, uh, you know, remember from your elementary school days, has these bony plates on uh, on its back. And of course, when I was a kid, I was like, well, you know, this is Stegosaurus, right? It has to be awesome battle armor, right? This is Stegosaurus, right? It has these giant bony plates. Like, I'm not going to mess with this thing that has these giant bony plates on its back. Well, it turns out that mm, closer analysis um, and closer uh, biology. Um, informs us that Stegosaurus was not, uh, these plates on Stegosaurus's back was not actually awesome battle armor, but rather heat transfer fins. So plates that basically increased Stegosaurus's heat transfer. And why, so why would Stegosaurus need heat transfer? Well, reptiles, unlike mammals, reptiles can't sweat. So, you know, when mammals get hot, when I get really hot, I just sweat and that sweat carry, the sweat evaporates and carries out the heat. But Stegosaurus couldn't sweat. So what did Stegosaurus do? Stegosaurus had these plates that had these blood vessels that flowed through the plates. And when Stegosaurus got really hot, it basically opened up circulation to the plates, circulating blood through the plates, getting the plates really hot that could then reject heat to the environment. But when Stegosaurus was, uh, wanted to conserve body heat, it could cut off circulation to these plates. So Stegosaurus had plates not for super awesome battle armor, but because it conferred an evolutionary advantage, um, allowing it to cool itself when it needed to, but not when it didn't. So, you know, is battle armor cooler than heat transfer plates? Well, maybe, I'll leave that, uh, I'll leave that judgment up to you, but I think they're awesome either way. So let's start formulating our problem. Let's imagine we have you know, some solid wall right here. And sticking out of this wall is, is a protrusion. Might look like this. And let's say our wall is really hot and there's some, some temperature, let's say at the base of the fin right here. Let's call it T base. And, um, and then there's some fluid kind of far away here, T infinity. And let's say this base temperature is much hotter than T infinity right here. So, uh, and we're looking to basically figure out, hey, you know, what is temperature as a function of position? So what do I mean? Let's define some coordinate X that basically starts at the base and is the, the length down the fin, right? So this might be the part of, so this, you know, could be our handle for our cast iron pan. And this is the base of the pan, you know, where the handle meets the hot, the hot pan. And, you know, this would be the part that's okay for my hand to touch right here. So uh, I might anticipate, you know, I might want to say, hey, you know, what might be temperature? What might be temperature as a function of position X, right? So I could say, hey, you know, what is the temperature of this this fin is a function of position x and you know i might say you know let's let's sort of 
consider the case where the base temperature is hotter than T infinity. I might start up at T base right here, and you know the hottest part of the fin is going to be you know the base temperature right here, and we expect this temperature to sort of be decreasing and eventually sort of asymptoting to whatever the ambient temperature is, right? The very tip of the pan was was barely above room temperature, whereas the base was quite hot. So what what might that look like? Temperature as a function of position right here. I might anticipate this kind of you know asymptoting eventually to be T infinity. T infinity right here, T base right here. And our question is, you know, hey, what you know what is what is this function gonna look like? We'll give ourselves this goal of essentially deriving this function, you know, as a as a function of other uh, as a function of sort of known parameters in the problem. All right, so let's say we know T infinity, let's say we know T base, let's say we know um, a couple, let's say we know some properties of, of our system, right? So we have some fluid out here, some solid fin right here. Um, so we have our solid fin. Let's say we need, let's say we know the thermal conductivity of the fin. Um, let's say we know the cross-sectional area of the fin. Let's say we know the perimeter right, the perimeter of, of the of a cross the perimeter of a cross section right here. Um, let's say we know H and we're assuming that H is sort of constant over the whole fin, right? We're assuming that, you know, if there's some fluid flowing past it, it's not like the fluid's flowing faster at the tip than at the base. So, um, so you know, all things considered, that might not be necessarily true, but, you know, let's, let's sort of use this as our, um, as our baseline. Um, and, yeah, and we know T infinity and T base as well. So, you know, let's say, hey, you know, if we knew these parameters right here, you know, does this give us a, enough information to derive this as of yet unknown temperature profile? So if this is the problem that we're attempting to solve, we're looking to derive this temperature profile T as a function of X um, to, to basically figure out, hey, how much, how much heat in watts is flowing kind of into the base of the fin, right? Because any heat that flows into the base of a fin, you know, eventually needs to make its way out all of the surfaces, right? So some, some heat gets convected here and the rest of it here and the rest of it here and the rest of it here and eventually all of it ends out, ends out by the time, you know, we get to the very tip of the fin. So that's, that's where we're going. Um, so what do we need to do first? Well, we need to define a shell. We'll choose a sensible delta dimension and then we'll apply conservation of energy to that shell. Right, so what so what you know what might be a sensible shell shell to do? Well, if I anticipate temperature being a function of position x, then this might inc then then this uh, a sensible thing to do would be to choose x as a delta to choose x as our delta dimension. And I guess if we had a cylindrical fin, strictly speaking, we could say temperature, you know, we could have temperature variations with R as well. But typically, if the fin is much longer than it is in diameter, um, then we're going to have much greater, we're going to have much more appreciable temperature variations in X than R, right? So strictly speaking, temperature could vary with R, but, you know, um, but in this case, we're going to uh, going to neglect it, right? So I guess we're going to assume um, T varies with X only, not with R. And that's basically saying that, hey, you know, I might have some points at the very core. I might have some points close to the surface. These points are basically going to be at the same temperature, whereas these points are going to be at much different temperatures. So with this in mind, with the idea of temperature varying with x, but not appreciably with r, we'll choose x as our delta dimension. And if we choose x as our delta dimension, you know, what is my, what is my shell going to look like? Well, my shell is going to look something like this. 
or where the thickness uh, or my shell is sort you can imagine like essentially slicing up this fin into a stack of pennies my shell is basically going to be like one of the pennies in this stack so in this case delta x is basically going to be this dimension right here the thickness of one of the slices All right so this is sorry it's barely legible Delta X is basically the thickness of one of my slices. It's the thickness of one of the pennies that make up the stack. So choosing X is going to be our, our delta dimension. So let's draw let's draw that shell a little bit bigger to work out conservation of energy that we that we're going to apply that we're going to apply to the shell. Alright, so let's keep track of um, of our things right here. So if we do conservation energy, what might conservation of energy look like? Well, uh, in general, we have our accumulation equals ins minus outs plus generation. Uh, let's additionally assume that we're sort of analyzing the system in steady state, right? So, you know, I invited you to look at my cast iron pan. I, I, I said, you know, hey, let's, you know, let's give this thing time to, to fully heat up. You know, let's assume that we're in steady state. It is possible to, to analyze uh, transient heat transfer with fins, but it's a hot mess. Let's be on the scope of what we can do in this class. So let's look at the steady state um, fin conduction case. Right, so if we're looking at our conservation of energy, well, we can get rid of accumulation if we're steady. And also, you know, if I look at this fin, you know, um, unless I'm like running electrical current through the fin or something silly like that, um, I'm, I'm also basically going to have no, no generation within my fin as well, right? So, so there's like no reactions no um, electrical heaters, etc. Not not within the fin anyway, not within not within this slice of the fin that we made. So what does this mean? We basically need to sort out our ins and outs in terms of conservation of energy. So if I think about it, this rear face right here, sorry, this rear face of the fin, we could say is at position X and the front face of the fin might be at position x plus delta x. And if I think about um, uh, what heat transfer might be going into or out of various parts of this thing, well, um, I have conduction. So conduction is kind of going, so heat is getting conducted down the fin, but periodically convected out the sides um, of, because out the sides of the the slices or out the sides of the fin is basically the part that's in contact with the air. So it's solid solid contact on these front and back faces and then solid liquid contact on the edges. So if I think about solid solid contact I could basically say hey there's some as of yet unknown Q, Q dot conduction that's flowing into the surface and this conductive heat transfer you know, is heading, let's say, in the positive x direction, right? Sort of, we could say, hey, there's some heat, um, there's some conductive heat transfer, and um, and you know, since since we're saying that you know temperature varies only with x, you know, it's sort of implied that this heat this heat conduction would be going in the x direction, and we could say that this is evaluated at x, and then we'd have some conduction coming out this face, right? Sort of by definition. Um, a conductive, you know, QX, I guess it's strictly speaking, it would be like QX conduction, and X, there would be a QX conduction. Uh, only this one would be evaluated at X plus delta X. And these conductive heat transfers aren't necessarily the, not, aren't necessarily the same as each other because we have some amount of heat that goes in this, in this face here, and only some of that heat um, comes out, but the rest of it comes out as convection. Uh, convection right here, and by definition, convection is from the solid surface to the li uh, to the liquid around it. In which case, you know, which could be like air for the example of my um, my cast iron pans handle. So these are my ins and outs. I have some 
conduction at x, and that's an in, some conduction at x plus delta x, and that's an out, and some convection that's leaving out of, that convection is sort of leaving out of this sort of side area like this. So those are my, those are my ins and outs. So if I wanted to tabulate them up, I might say 0 is equal to q dot x conduction evaluated at x minus q dot x conduction evaluated at x plus delta x um, minus because it's because this one is an out, this one was an in, and this one was an out, and I have another out minus q dot convection um, along this slice as well. So these are my ins and outs. Our goal was to derive temperature as a function of position x, but here we have heat flows, but we know that a lot of times we might be able to relate heat flows to temperatures and get some sort of differential equation that perhaps we can solve, um, solve for x. So right now we're dealing with heat flows. Eventually we might be able to get this in terms of temperatures. So let's talk about convection and then let's also talk about these conduction terms as well. So let's do the easier one first. Uh, my q dot convection. What well, we can apply Newton's law of cooling to this slice right here. And we can basically say, hey, convection is, uh, is equal to a couple things. So there's some area, whatever area this surface has, times h times ts minus t infinity, where ts is something that you know we haven't quite squared away yet. It's whatever temperature this surface of the metal is at. Or surface of the fin is at, and area, uh, surface area is basically this surface area right here. Well, can we start expressing this in terms of, you know, things things we know and care about? Yes, we can. So we have our q dot convection, the surface area of this fin. Well, pause and ponder. You know, what what is the surface area? Um, what is the surface area that's that uh, that is contributing to convection right here? So pause and ponder. What is this? What is that surface area in terms of you know things that we are given or are using for this problem? Well, if we've had a chance to pause and ponder, the surface area here. Well, you can imagine it's basically if I took this surface here, plus you know sort of that surface like all the way around to the other side. Right. So it's basically this this kind of ring around my. Um, my shell right here is basically all of this. Well, it would be if I took this and unwrapped it to form a rectangle where one of the dimensions of that rectangle is x and the other dimension of that rectangle was essentially the perimeter, you know, which if this were circular would be pi d. But we'll just we'll just leave it in terms of perimeter for now, right? So surface area would be perimeter times delta x. I still have my h here. And then my ts, well by ts I can just, you know, I'm saying I'm neglecting temperature variations with r. So in this case any any temperature that I have at the surface right here is basically whatever temperature I have um, within this within this thing as well, right? So here I can just, you know, ts I can just say it's it's t, right? You know, there's there's not a difference between the surface temperature and the core temperature of the fin right here. And I have my minus t infinity. Okay, great. Right, so here's so here's convection. Nice. Now let's deal with conduction. Well, in retrospect, let's leave can leave, leave these in terms of where they are right now, and we'll come back to putting them in terms of temperature in just a sec. All right, so let's let's at least plug our convection in and sort of see where that gets us. So if we plug our convection in and do a little rearranging, we end up with zero is equal to minus. So I'm basically, you know, I'm going to plug this stuff in, and I'm also going to sort of rearrange some terms as well. Um, what do I get? I get q x conduction evaluated at x plus delta x minus q 
conduction evaluated at x um, divided by delta x. So I have the difference in my two conduction terms divided by delta x, and then I have a minus um, p h t minus t infinity. And that's basically just plugging this in here and dividing everything by delta x. Well, if you look, this is looking awfully familiar. Right? This basically looks like what? Well, I mean, this basically looks like a derivative, right? So this is essentially the derivative of my conductive heat flow with respect to x. So what can I do? I can basically take limits. I can take a limit as delta x approaches 0. And what do I end up with? I end up with 0 equals minus d q conduction dx minus ph t minus v infinity t minus t infinity all right so here i have it i have a differential equation well ultimately our, our goal was to get a differential equation with temperature in it so we could get a temperature profile but here we have a differential equation we have a differential equation with conductive heat flow in it but, you know, what can we do? Well, we can make progress here. Um, I kind of actually, strictly speaking, this would be a partial derivative, but I just cut to the cut to the chase saying, hey, this conductive heat flow should vary only with x. You know, um, uh, you know there's, we're sort of neglecting variations with r or theta or time or anything else. So I sort of cut to the chase and put ordinary derivatives here, just, just for those of you who, um, who follow very closely with those things. All right, so our goal is to get a differential equation for temperature. We didn't quite do that. Um, but if we wanted to bring in temperature, what could we do? Well, we can put uh, Q dot conduction in terms of temperature. In terms of temperature via Fourier's law. Remember, Fourier's law gave a relationship between temperature gradient and conductive heat flows. So what would that be? Um, well, Q dot conduction, if we did it for x, would be the following. It would be minus k times cross-sectional area times dt dx, where I'm using ordinary derivatives here, assuming temperature varies with only with x. Right, this is Fourier's law right here. So what can we do? We can plug this in to that derivative right here. And what do we get when we do that? Well, we get the following. We get Q, uh, 0 equals minus d dx of minus k times cross-sectional area times dt dx. And then this whole thing is then minus p times h times t minus t infinity. Oh, sorry, t infinity should be a known, known constant. All right, so what can we do? So just as an interesting side note, actually up until this point, um, we've actually allowed for a variable k cross-sectional area p and h and t infinity so up until this point we've actually actually haven't we haven't needed to assume that any of these are constant with x yet um, but it's coming right so if we assume that k if we assume that k a c p and h do not vary with x, then we can regroup a lot of terms in this equation uh, as follows. So if we if we assume those, then you know then we can basically take these and you know pull it out of this derivative. Right? If these are constants with respect to x, they can pop right out, um, and and you end up with the following. So if we assume that you know these things are constant, we end up with zero is equal to d squared t dx squared minus 
pH over KAC times T minus T infinity. All right, um, so so there we have it. Um, why do we have a second derivative here? Well, we got we got one dt. We got one derivative with respect to x from heat flow from Fourier's law, and then we had a derivative of that because heat because the heat flow itself varied with x. So we basically got one derivative from my ins and outs being different with respect to x and taking limits. And then we got a second derivative when the then we plugged in dt dx into this derivative here, right? So that's why we got a second derivative um, with respect to temperature. So here we have it. We have our differential equation. So if only you know the clouds were to open up and out would pop out some solution to this differential equation, you know, then we would be very happy, right? Um, but, you know, what's a little tricky about this differential equation? Well, you know, can, can we separate variables and integrate? Mm, not so much, right? We can't really pull this to the left-hand side because separation of variables, we'd need all the t's on one side and all the x's on the other. And we, so, uh, and we can't solve it, right? So we can't use our, our old friend separation of variables and integration a sad face. We can't do this. We can't do separation of variables and integration. So what do we need to do? Well, um, we need to pull a couple of tricks to solve this differential equation. So our first trick, our first trick is just to make make the bookkeeping a little bit easier. Easier. So I. I'm going to be honest, I don't really feel like writing P times H over K times AC or perimeter times convection coefficient divided by thermal conductivity times cross-sectional area. I don't feel like writing that a million times. So what am I going to do? I'm going to define this term M. And I'm going to say that this is uh, that M squared is equal to P times H over K times AC or M is equal to the square root of P times H over K times AC. And now I'm just going to need to pull through one variable in all of my next couple of steps as opposed to this collection of four variables here. And since P, H, K, and AC were all knowns, I can basically treat M, uh, M as if it's a known as well. Our second trick is to, defi is to define the following. Um, I'm going to define this variable theta, which is not an angle. Right, it's not, even though all the time engineers use theta as an angle, in this case it's not an angle. You can basically picture this as a temperature difference. So theta, I'm defining theta to be t minus t infinity. So basically, but you know, I'm defining theta to be t minus t infinity. And what's what's the benefit there? Well, instead of carrying around this t minus t infinity in all my equations, I can just kind of plug in theta. So you know, um, so instead of having t minus t infinities all over the places, it's just I'm just going to replace it with a single variable theta. That if I ever wanted to, you know, if I had some theta and if I wanted to go back in terms of temperatures, all I need to do is essentially add t infinity to theta to get back to temperature. So when you see theta for the rest of this lecture, think temperature or in particular temperature difference. So what's d theta dx going to be? Well, d theta dx is basically just going to be dt dx because t infinity is a constant so I can basically differentiate both sides with respect to x to sort of get what d theta dx is in terms of dt dx it's just they're the same and if I take a derivative again d squared theta dx squared is going to be d squared t dt squared so taking this and this and this, I can combine all of this junk together 
by their powers combined, I can get the following differential equation. 0 is equal to d squared theta dx squared minus m squared theta. And this is a differential equation. Unfortunately, we still can't, we, even for this one, we still can't separate variables and integrate, but we at least got a slightly simpler, slightly less messy differential equation than this one. Now, for those of you who have taken a differential equations class, you might have seen this and say, hey, wait a second, this is looking awfully similar to an equation that I might have seen before. This, you know, this is looking awfully similar to maybe like d, d squared x dt squared plus omega, omega n squared x is equal to zero. You know, this is looking very similar to this. And if, uh, and if you look at this equation, this is simple harmonic motion. So, you know, what sort of answers do we get for simple harmonic motion? You end up with, you know, x as a function of t. You end up with sines and cosines as your solution. And this is basically what you get for, like, a mass that's oscillating on a spring if you care about dynamics. Um, so this differential equation is similar to this one. It turns out for this one, instead of getting sines and cosines for your general solution, you end up with a general solution of the form for this equation theta as a function of x is equal to the following. You end up with theta is equal to c1 times e to the minus m x plus c2 is equal to e to the plus m. Well, I'll just, I'll just put mx. So you basically end up with, instead of sines and cosines as solutions, you end up with a pair of exponentials as your solution. And you can see that if I took this, took this thing, differentiated it twice, right, the m minus m would come down, and then the minus, a second minus m would come down, and I end up with an m squared out front. Two m's would come down here. And you, if I took that and plugged it into here, you can see like those, you know, if I took this and plugged it here, and then differentiated this twice and plugged it into here, you would see that those terms would cancel out because two m's would come down when I took the second derivatives there. So this, uh, this, general, this general solution satisfies this differential equation basically no matter what c1 and c2 are. So here we found our general solution, but this general solution doesn't necessarily give us this temperature profile that we want. This, this general solution, um, we, we still need to resolve our as of yet unknown our unknown C1 and C2 which we can resolve with boundary conditions. So if you're following along in our plan for solving this problem you know we defined our shell, we applied conservation of energy, we did ins and outs, we took limits, we got a derivative which was a differential equation we talked about a couple of tricks and some generals, and we got to our general solution. Now that we have our general solution, we need to resolve this uh, the unknown constants, in this case our C1 and C2, with thinking about boundary conditions. So let's think about boundary conditions. And when we think about boundary conditions, I'm going to make one additional assumption that I'll add to our assumptions list over here. I'm going to assume that the fin is long, right, that, we have a that we have a very long fin, a practically infinitely long fin. So when we think about boundary conditions, we like to think about places in our system where we have the most information about what's going on. And when I think about this system, well, we certainly have information about what's happening at the base, right? We know what, what temperature we have at the base. 
right? So we basically say, you know, hey, temperature at x equals, sorry, temperature at x equals zero, that should be equal to T base. So if we wanted to say, hey, you know, if we wanted to use this boundary condition, well, here we have this equation for theta, you know, we could express this in terms of theta. Or in terms of theta, we could basically say theta at x equals zero, or we could use this theta equals t minus t infinity. So I could say theta at x equals zero is equal to t base minus t infinity. Right, where I could just essentially plug in t base right here and get whatever theta I would have at the base. So that's my theta at x equals zero. So this is one of our boundary conditions that we're going to use. Where else do I have information about temperatures in this system? This is a little bit trickier. Maybe this would have been a good pause and ponder question. So pause and ponder. You know, where, what else do I have? Where else do I have information? You know, where else could I apply a boundary condition for this system? Well, if we think about it, if we think about this very long, you know, this fin as being very long, what's going to happen to temperature as x goes to infinity? Well, as x goes to infinity, our t of x should, you know, the very tip of this fin, all the way, all the way over here, all the way super far off the screen, you know, eventually that fin is going to be in equilibrium with t infinity right here. So our second boundary condition is not x at some p particular location. But as x approaches infinity, temperature should approach t infinity. Or in terms of theta, um, theta as x approaches infinity, this should approach, well, um, so what should theta approach? be a good pause and ponder question. So what should theta approach as x approaches infinity? Pause and ponder. Well, um, as x approaches infinity, t becomes t infinity. So t minus t infinity approaches 0. So as x approaches infinity, theta should approach 0. Great. Now, so uh, so there we have it. Theta as x approaches infinity should approach zero, basically saying the temperature difference between the fin and the environment as x approaches infinity is zero. Now, um, take a moment now, pause and ponder. See if you can find C1 and C2. And spoiler alert, it'll be actually a little easier to find C2 first. All right, so hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder. Pause and ponder. Um, what can we do? Well, we can essentially plug in infinity into this equation here and, and make sure that equals 0. So we'll take our second boundary condition and we'll apply it. So we will know 0 has to be equal to the left-hand side. We'll have C1 times e to the minus m e to the minus m infinity. Well, um, e to the minus uh, e to the minus infinity is essentially one over e to the infinity. Well, e to the infinity blows up, but one over e to the infinity essentially becomes zero, right? So this whole term is basically zero, and then we have plus c two times e to the m times infinity. This term, you know, e to the infinity is essentially infinity. And we know that it doesn't make sense that temperature, you know, that if I go down my fin, all of a sudden temperature spikes off to infinity. No way. That doesn't make sense. So temperature, temperature can't approach. So physically, we know 
So we know that uh, so we know that temperature doesn't go to infinity at the tip. So the only way to make sure that temperature doesn't go to infinity at the tip is to make sure that C2, C2's got to be equal to zero. So if we conclude that C2 is equal to zero, what does that leave us with? Well, now we have our theta as a function of x is equal to just C1 times e to the e to the minus mx. So we can now use our first boundary condition here to then help resolve C1. So t base minus t infinity is equal to C1 times e to the minus m times 0. Right? If we evaluate this at x equals 0, well, e to the 0, basically anything to the 0 is 1. So that means basically C1 is equal to t base minus t infinity. So where does that leave us? Our theta, sorry. Our theta as a function of x is equal to t base minus t infinity times e to the minus m m x. All right, success. In case you got a little bit lost in the thetas, let's now let's put this instead in terms of temperatures. So we could put this back in terms of temperatures. So t as a function of x is equal to t base minus t infinity e to the minus mx and then plus t infinity where we could do a couple sanity checks here. Um, we could basically say, hey, what happens as x goes to infinity? As x goes to infinity, this term disappears, which means this whole term, whole front term disappears. So t of x should be t infinity. At x equals 0, e to the 0 is 1. So we get t base minus t infinity plus t infinity, or just t base. And we can think about this m here. If you recall, m is equal to the square root of p times h over k times ac. So let's 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 do a little bit more interpret interpretation there. So anytime we have some final result like this, it's good to do a couple of sanity checks, right? So as, as perimeter goes up, what does that mean? Well, um, what, what is the general form of this equation looks like? Well, before, yeah, before we get too deep into all the parameters here, let's, let's plot, you know, t of x versus x. So take a moment, pause and ponder, you know, see what this curve might look like. You know, see what, what does the form of this function look like? Well, I start out with t base right here. Let's say there's some t infinity right here. My t of x looks like this. So t of x looks like this. This is essentially exponential decay. And the, the parameter that governs this exponential decay is this parameter m. So m, a larger m essentially means this exponential decay happens more quickly. It's sort of like, you know, m is, is sort of like an accelerant for x, right? So what does this mean? If there's a large m, this decay happens quickly. If there's a large m, that decay happens quickly. If there's a slow m, if there's a small m, the decay happens much more slowly. So this is the effect of m. So what do I mean? Um, so as p goes up, so, so now let's sort of look at parameters here. So if p goes up, then m goes up, which basically means this decay happens quickly. 
um, or happens over short distance. And what does that mean? Well, this basically means like, hey, if I, t if I took this fin and instead of having it as a cylinder, if I flattened it out into a thin radiator plate, um, you know, instead of having a cylinder sticking out from my surface, if it were a thin radiator, pl radiator plate, where I had, let's say, the same cross-sectional area, but much more perimeter, then that heat would, would decay more quickly. So, you know, this is, this is why you might see, you know, in air conditioners, instead of having meter-long cylindrical wires sticking out of the radiators, they have a couple centimeter-long flat plates to make that temperature, you know, once you get to the tip of the fins, um, that temperature decays off quickly, right? So this is why your air conditioner radiators, you know, are flattened into plates rather than, um, you know, thick cylinders is because the, thick, the thin plates have a lot more perimeter to basically make that temperature decay happen over a shorter distance. So they don't need to have quite as big of a, big of a heat sink on there. Um, similarly, we can say um, as H, as H goes up, M goes up, so decay happens also over a short distance in this case, right? And this and this makes sense too, right? If we have more convection, right? If convection is much stronger on the surface of this fin, you know, then the temperature, you know, as I travel down the fin is going to much more quickly approach T infinity. So that makes sense too. Um, we can also say, you know, we also look at our at our M right here, and as K goes up, M goes down, so decay is longer distance, i.e. more like the pink one, and, and that makes sense too, right? If I make my fin, if I, I make my fin out of a thermally conductive material, then that surface of the fin is going to be much hotter by the time, uh, you know, it, that heat conduction, that heat's going to very, you know, is going to conduct very quickly, keeping that whole fin hot, you know, that whole surface of the fin hot in comparison to how much of that heat is getting leached out the side, right? So, you know, K goes up, M goes down, decays over a longer distance, and the same rationale is for a cross-sectional area. If cross-sectional area goes up, M goes down, and the decay is also over a longer distance, where basically, um, if I have a big thick fin, then that heat is going to want to get conducted down the fin rather than convected out the side. So there we have it. All right, now let's do this final thing that we wanted to do. We wanted to say, hey, you know, we wanted this temperature profile, but a lot of times what we cared about is, hey, can I relate this Q dot of the fin in terms of things that I know, like, for example, you know, T base minus T infinity, H, K, AC perimeter, etc. Right? Can I put this heat? Can I put the heat flow out of the fin in terms of constants that I know and care about in this problem? And the answer is yes, we can. So let's add just a little bit more clarity. What do I what do I mean by Q dot for the fin? So we have our fin. It's a very long fin. And I say, hey. There's some heat that basically enters through the base, enters into the base of the fin, and I'm going to call this Q dot fin. And if I kind of imagined a, a control volume around the whole fin, any heat that goes into the base of the fin is heat that eventually makes it as convection. out of all of the edges, right? And you can imagine, you know, some of this heat basically comes in and dips out here, and some of this heat comes in and dips out here, and some of it comes in and dips out here, right? So we basically have some heat that enters through this surface right here via conduction. It's conduction right here, right here, and then eventually it leaves this convection off of this entire surface. It would be pretty messy to try to evaluate all of this right here, but I can use this idea that there's conduction at the base to help me out. So I could say my, the Q dot leaving my fin is going to be equal to whatever conduction, whatever conduction is happening right at the base. 
is equal to conduction at the base. Well, conduction at the base, I can basically apply Fourier's law. So Fourier's law basically says, you know, um, minus k times cross-sectional area times dt dx evaluated. And in this case, the heat for the whole fin, if I evaluate conduction right at the base, that's the heat flow out of the whole fin. You know, basically whatever heat comes into the base here eventually leaves everywhere else. So q dot fin into the base is the same as q dot fin out of all of what's happening here. So q dot fin minus k times ac times dt dx evaluated at x equals zero. So what can I do? I can take this t of x that I just derived, just spent you know an hour or whatever deriving, and I could plug that into dt dx right here, and then after I've plugged it in, evaluate it at x equals zero. So what is that going to look like? Here I have minus k times ac times d, d dx of the following of this expression here ddx of the t of x that I get, you know, that I get from right here. Um, and then if I, uh, and then evaluate that whole thing at x equals zero. So when you do, um, so when you, when you take this and evaluate it in, you get um, minus k times ac, which you have from up here. Then you end up with, um, you know, if you take this derivative with respect to x, you still have your t base minus t infinity. When you take the derivative with respect to x, you get a minus m that comes out. Um, and then the derivative with respect to x, you then have e to the, you, you know, the derivative of e to the minus mx is minus m times e to the minus mx. So, and then when you evaluate it at uh, x equals 0, you get e to the minus m 0. And then the plus t infinity, you, you know, taking the derivative of a constant, you get you get 0, right? So we now have this expression right here. Um, when you evaluate it, right, if you plug in m is equal to the square root of uh, pH over k times ac, you actually notice that like the square root of k to the ac in the denominator cancels with part of the k ac right here and you end up with q fin q fin is equal to the following term t base minus t infinity times square root of h times p times k times ac and this is our cool result. All right, one last thing to do here. Remember, baby, you know who? She's going to get awfully upset if we don't what? If we don't check units, right? So, q fin, q fin is q fin better have units of watts. So whatever we have on the right hand side should also have units for watts. A temperature difference is going to have units of Kelvin, and then we should have square root. H is going to have units of watts per meter squared Kelvin. Perimeter is a length, so that's going to have units of meters. Thermal conductivity have watts per meter Kelvin. And cross-sectional area is going to have units of meters squared. If you look at here, this meter squared cancels with this meter squared. This meters cancels with this meters. So then we end up with watts squared over Kelvin squared, which when you take the square root of that, you end up with watts per Kelvin. You multiply that by Kelvin, and you have watts here. We also have a sanity check here that if I increase the temperature difference between whatever temperature is at the base of my fin, and whatever temperature, you know, if I increase the difference between the temperature of the base and the T infinity, then I'm going to get more heat that flows out of the fin. That makes sense. You know, so if I increase the, the difference between the base and the T infinity, then, you know, then I'm going to get more heat flow. If I increase H, then I also get more heat flow. If I increase perimeter, then I also get more heat flow, right? Perimeter means there's more area for convection, 
so I get more heat flow. If I increase the thermal conductivity, that means that fin is better at leaching heat away from the base. And if that fin is better at leaching heat from the base, that means the tip is going to be, you know, there's going to be less of a temperature difference, you know, farther out at the tip than at the base. So it's not just like the base is really hot, but the tips not do anything, right? So basically, the the thermal conductivity keeps the tip of the fin from being useless, right? So thermal conductivity basically means that the heat flow of the fin is better. And cross-sectional area basically means that there's more heat, more area for that heat to get convected or to get conducted out and then eventually um, get convected out. So the cross-sectional area, so basically K and AC keep tip from being ineffective. And H and P mean we have good convection. So both of so basically the the conduction and convection work together to help make fins be an effective heat transfer. And that heat transfer is proportional to a temperature difference. So you can actually formulate, you know, a thermal resistance is essentially one over this quantity for fins. All right. So, uh, so what does that mean? You know, if we if we tie things back to our motivation, some fancy PCR machines have very carefully designed fin-like structures to help increase the cooling um, for amplifications. And also, things like dinosaurs have fins on them to help increase. Dinosaurs have fins on them to help increase their heat transfer to their environments as well. So, hopefully, you enjoyed this lecture. Um, thanks for watching, and good luck with your study of heat transfer. Take care.